Dr. Uh, Emil Silvestru is no stranger to many of you who watch 100 Huntley Street. I've interviewed him five times before and loved every one. I know you did too, and it's great to have him back. This time, Emil, I've got uh, a book that you created uh, under the general title of Wonders of Creation called The Cave Book. And I'm sure for you, you know, this is really basic stuff. For me, it was like a revelation. Uh, as a karstologist, and that's a term most people haven't heard before, no. you specialize not just in caves, but the whole underground uh, um, environment, right? Environment, yes. uh, tell me how you got into it. Well, it all started with me exploring caves at a very young age. I think my first visit to a cave was at age five. Really? And I remember distinctly as my parents told me, don't go there, there's a, a, a wolf, or down there is a big snake. They just wanted to make sure I'm not going to crawl into those passages. So I obeyed, but at age 12 I returned at the very same cave, determined to find out if those beasts were really there. <laughs> well, I couldn't find them, but I just discovered this. And, you know, if you think about it, a cave can be a place in which you are the first person to set foot ever since God created that place. Right. A white spot, as they used to call it. And you don't have to travel distances to, to, to get to this exotic place. So I got immediately hooked on it. As a child, of course, it was mostly adrenaline rush and, mm. and, and you know, uh, the attraction to the unknown. And this was in Romania, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any idea, as a Christologist, how many caves might be out there that haven't been uh, uh, discovered yet or haven't been explored? Oh, uh, I think the majority of them would be still undiscovered. Majority. You see, you look into China, for example. China came onto the scene pretty late amongst us because it didn't open up to, to, to scientists from the West. But I mean, in China, there's 1.2 million square kilometers of limestone terrains. Mm -hmm. And some of the records keep coming from there. Vietnam, like the, the world's largest cave passage, you no, know, it's been wrongly presented as the world's biggest cave. It's not, you see, because it's just a passage but it's the largest known and it's humongous. So these are new discoveries that pop up every now and then. You have the Papua New Guinea jungle and in there it's very difficult to, to have any kind of access. You know? So I'm, I'm convinced that the majority of caves are still undiscovered. Are there any karstologists or just uh, spelunkers out there whose mission in life is to find uh, undiscovered or unmapped caves? I think so. You know, I, I think that what uh, actually Mallory answered when he was asked, why do you have to climb Mount Everest? And because it exists. Yeah. Why do you have to go on the ground? Because there's unknown space in there. And it's our basic nature, I guess, just to discover the unknown. Now, one thing that would be counterproductive would be uh, claustrophobia. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right. laughs> there's, there's a few pictures in the book here, uh, sort of an animations of, of what you've got to go through. I mean, sometimes you, it is a tight squeeze, right? It is. Do you ever get stuck? No, I never got stuck uh, because I had experience. Right. If you learn this particular kind of exploration properly, you will always think before you get into a, a squeeze tight like that, if you can return. If you're just enthusiastic, then of course you can get stuck. And I did have some friends which I had to extract almost like a cork out of a bottle. You know, we used to joke though that there are only two kinds of people who are claustrophobic. The ones that are afraid of uh, tight places and the other ones were afraid of Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much we could talk about when it comes to caves. Um, I mean, uh, I would love to have several hours just discussing it with you because I'm, I'm intrigued. I've been in a few caves in my life as a kid, like you, uh, and I, I was in one cave a few years ago in South Africa that astonished me, uh, full of stalagmites and stalactites. And Would that be Congo caves? Congo? You've been there? Yes. Is it Congo or Conga? Congo. Congo, yeah, Congo case. That's exactly where we work, my wife and I. And I, I was loath to leave. I, I wished I could have spent hours in there. I was absolutely a wonderland. It, mm -hmm. By the way, is that place unusual? Uh, no. no. No, it's the standard cave. But what was unusual when my wife and I visited it yes. is that we stayed at the very end with the guide. Right. And my wife started sharing the gospel. And turns out the guide was a pastor's son. He was a Christian. So we ended up singing hymns in the <laughs> cave. <laughs> <laughs> we have been given a special tour just for us, you know, because I was a professional. So what did your voices sound like in the Congo caves? I would say heavenly I'll in bet. hell. <laughs> <laughs> now, your worldview, you, 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 you accept the biblical uh, narrative uh, of God creating the world in uh, six uh, literal days, yes. six 24-hour periods. Um, your scientific inquiries... Uh, are they ever in a kind of a, 
uh, dissonance with that belief? And or if not, what is it about what you've discovered that affirms that belief? Well, you see, it is all about epistemology, the way we gain our knowledge. And I must say that for a very long time, most of my scientists' life, I didn't realize the importance of that particular aspect. That's why now, in the last few years, I've been pushing this idea a lot. It is not about the facts. It is about how you interpret the facts that changes the way that you see and, and perceive reality around you. So yeah, of course, you know, I, I'm the last person who can say I can be objective as I go out in the field and look for evidence. You know, because I'm not looking for evidence, I'm looking for facts. Mm -hmm. But do I collect those facts without a bias? No, I have already a bias in me. Yeah. And that's why sometimes I miss some facts, because my bias prevents me from seeing them. So that's why I have to return. And it did happen to me many times, go two, three, four times to the same location. And only then I had the aha moment. So there are many aspects of geological research that seem to collide with my Christian faith. And I need to literally, in a conscientious way, remind myself every single time I look at the things, wait a minute, don't forget that you have been taught all of your life and, life and then you taught other students how to look at rocks. And it is the way they've been taught to look at, not the rocks themselves, that are the issue. Is it possible to uh, step back from that, uh, that training you know, and look at things objectively? Very, very difficult. Yeah. It is so insidious. Well, I shouldn't say insidious, but it's so deeply ingrained in almost every neuron of your brain. Yeah. Even your senses sometimes deceive you in that particular respect. So it has to be a constant conscientious effort to retrain your mind. But in time, it turns from an effort into a joy. Mm. Because the sheer fact that you can basically separate facts from interpretations, get closer to the truth of things, and, and discovering how simple it is, if you look at it that way, you know, is, is really an intellectual pleasure. I'm sure. Tell me about the, the, the flood. Uh, the Genesis account teaches a universal flood mm -hmm. that was on the face of the earth for a very long time. Uh, just the thought of the entire earth being covered by water is, uh, it, it boggles the mind. But why do you believe the flood was universal? What evidence do you see for it in, in terms of your specialist as a karstologist? Well, there are a number of facts that can be interpreted as a result of the flood, to be consistent with what I just said yeah. before. And probably the biggest one would be the existence of erosion surfaces, planation surfaces as sometimes are called, it are just very high up in the mountains, like you have a flat erosional surface, 3,000 meters of elevation, or you have some of them covering huge surfaces. Like there's here in, in, in Canada, for example, uh, where the tar sands are, the tar sands are resting on top of some Devonian limestones, and allegedly the 260 million years missing bef between the two. Well, that surface, which is called an unconformity, covers uh, over a million square kilometers. Now, how can you get something eroded flat over a million square kilometers without having a relief on it, mm. you know? Because it's, it's ironic. The fundamental principle of modern evolutionary geology is the principle of actualism, also known as uniformitarianism. So if you want to know how the past was, look at the present. It's the same forces. So look at the present. How does an erosional surface look? It's not flat. You have mountains, you have valleys, you have hills, you have a lot of important features of the landscape. So why is it that none of those unconformities that you find in the geological record, which covers huge surfaces, have such relief? Because they have been eroded fast by massive amounts of water. So that's evidence to me that there's been a massive hydraulic catastrophe. Um, then you have another thing, the continuity of sediments. You take, for example, the Coconino sandstone, which is very visible in the Grand Canyon. It covers half a million square kilometers in North America alone. How do you get the same layer covering such a huge surface unless there's a gigantic pouring of waters carrying that sediment? And these are fundamental entities of what we call on one side geomorphology but also sedimentology which need to be dealt with and they're never dealt with properly. They're registered with a name, unconformity or paraconformity or disconformity and that's it. 
And I remember when I was learning these things in school and then I was teaching them, I never thought, wait a minute, look around you. You never find that today because it's never flat, you know. So I would think, I would think that is the most important argument. Then there is the argument of massive layers containing dead creatures, the extinction levels. You know, how do you get an extinction unless there's a global catastrophe? Now, what, the, what, I, what I was taught, you know, when evolution was just simply the doctrine when I was in school, was that uh, there was um, a comet that, that hit the Earth and that killed all the dinosaurs. Oh, yeah, and that has been turned actually in a cyclical thing. I remember back in 1970 when the Alvarezes came up with this, the evidence for it, the iridium anomaly and, and all that, the idea was actually if you analyze the, the fossil record, there seems to be a cyclicity of these extinctions and they even calculated a a rate in about 26, 27 million years. Every 26, 27 million years there will be a catastrophe, an impact of some sorts. And they even connected that to a theoretical companion star to, to the Sun, which they even named Nemesis. <laughs> and as the Nemesis comes closer to the Sun, then you have such impacts. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that there have been impacts in, in the past. Did they cause catastrophe? No. Not in the, in the sense that they mentioned. Because, you know, if the meteor a meteorite impact destroyed the dinosaurs, which were reptiles, why the crocodiles survived un unscathed, unharmed? And why is it that very next to the, the, the famous uh, structure, the Chichalub st uh, um, impact structure in the Yucatan Peninsula, which is claimed to be the, the impactor that caused the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, why is it that very close to it, on the same layers, you find fossils of animals dying apparently in a quiet way. Oh. Well, if such a 25 kilometer diameter impact hit that place... You, Everything would be dead, right? 5,000 kilometers at least, not just dead, but shattered. Yeah, not just dinosaurs. Everything. Yes, but you don't have that. So it's quite a selective uh, process. But a flood, a flood would have wiped everything out and they would all have been deposited essentially in the same layer? Not, not necessarily. First of all, you wouldn't have everything covered in one shot with water. Right. It'll happen several stages. Right. Then once the entire planet is covered with water, your tides are going to be very regular, unlike now, and very even world, worldwide, because there's no landmass to, to create a, a difference. Right. So six, every six hours you have the waters going down, you might have some sediments appearing from underneath in, in the shallower areas, mm -hmm. and they will co be covered again. Mm. Now, I can easily imagine, for example, a huge amount of wood debris coming from the forest that existed before the flood, floating on the surface of the ocean. Huge floating islands, mm. which by the way could have carried some animals. So some of them wouldn't have died right away. Mm. They starved to death later on or some, uh, some other cause of death. So you will have areas with violent death. And suffice to go, just I'll give you one example. If you go to the Dinosaur National Monument in Utah, there's there the famous uh, Allosaurus uh, Jim Masony. Uh, it's in a swirling position, the head is missing, the whole animal is, is like a spiral, and the tail is broken, turn 180 degrees, and it's beneath. That's a very violent environment. Mm. You go to the Royal Tyrell Museum and you find there the Gorgosaurus, and then there's an Ornithomimus also, in the same spiraling situation. You can clearly see sw swirling waters that bury these things. In the same uh, area in the Badlands in Alberta, this bone bed number 40, which is made of 93 individuals, the skeletons of 93 individuals of one species, Centrosaurus. And the interpretation is that they, they were crossing the river and they were caught in a flash flood and then were carried and buried somewhere. So, you know, that happened to most dinosaurs everywhere mm -hmm. in the world? Yeah, of course, in the flood. So that would be the violent aspect. But you will have calmer areas. And then, of course, you will have many animals, especially the land animals, which died by drowning. Now, if they drown, they will not fossilize. They bloat, float, and decompose. So there's hardly any evidence left after them.